Okay, are we on? Okay, let's, let's start. Uh, so thank you for coming. Welcome to this panel on cybersecurity and how to take cybersecurity uh, to the next level. Uh, my name is Ludwig Ziegler. I work uh, for this magazine you may have heard about, The Economist. I'm their technology editor based in, in, in the US. And yes, uh, again, the, the panel's theme is taking cybersecurity to the next level. And it is part of a whole program of uh, events and discussions and hubs and what have you on that subject here at the WEF in Dalian. And I encourage you to at least attend one or two of them. It's uh, really a very impressive program. But before we start, uh, I'd like to uh, make a couple of preliminary uh, remarks. And, and I uh, assure you it's going to be very short. Uh, so you don't have to wait. You're not here to he listen to me. And uh, so I've been covering technology for 20 years, and um, uh, there's kind of like three things that uh, have struck me co in covering cyber cybersecurity. And one thing is, is of course, it's never going to go away. Uh, cybersecurity is one of those uh, topics that's uh, uh, been there all the time, and I think we can try really to solve that problem, but it's, it's like the human immune system, and we, we, we have medicine, we do wonders in medicine, we have vaccines and all that but still people are getting sick, and I think that's gonna happen with uh, uh, cybersecurity as well. So when we meet again here in 10 years in Dalian, we'll probably have a similar panel about the problems in cybersecurity back then. But the second point is the good news is that I think there is an increased awareness of uh, the issues of surrounding cybersecurity, uh, uh, not just in the US, but also around the world, and that's basically because uh, uh, I think you've read all the kind of the almost breathless or sometimes breathless coverage of, of security breaches, GDPR, all of that. So it's becoming a topic. It's becoming clear that it's a risk and it's very costly if you don't take care of it. And the third point is, and I think that's the most important point, it becomes increasingly clear that if you really want to tackle that, the problems uh, surrounding cybersecurity, we need to have international co uh, collaboration. We need to work together. We need to find common solutions. And what worries me a little bit is that actually uh, the world is moving a bit in the other direction. Cybersecurity is getting increasingly politicized and even weaponized. But we'll talk about that later during the panel. And we have a great panel here to discuss all these things. And I'm going to introduce them uh, by asking them a question. So Belsario, you work for the Organization of, of American States um, in DC, and you're in charge of cybersecurity. But the OAS and cybersecurity is not necessarily what, what I would intuitively put in one basket. So tell us about what you're doing there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lewin. And first of all, uh, first of all allow me to, to thanks, uh, express my gratitude to, to, the, to both the, the forum and OAS leadership for, for this opportunity to be with you, sharing uh, my, my own views and, and perspectives about uh, what is going on in on cyber security issues in Latin America and in this global context with, with, this, with this panel. Um, the OAS, um, for those that don't know or don't know, is the oldest regional organization of the world. Has been there for over a century. Um, we have been there before the UN and before other regional organizations. And we work, uh, we work with uh, four main pillars. Uh, security, development, uh, human rights, and, and we on the security, on the security pillar uh, have, a, have established a work for over two decades on, on cybersecurity issues. Since 1999, uh, our, attorney trade, uh, our attorney generals and, and prosecutors of the Americas uh, have uh, established several recommendations. At the same time, the telecom authorities and under the Committee Against Terrorism which our program is, we have worked on, on, on several issues. Right now, our program works on three major areas. One is policy development, technical capacities or capacity building, and research and outreach. From that perspective, we provide assistance to our 34 member states, which are from Canada to, to Argentina. And we have been able to, to accompany and to provide support, support to, to all our, our member states. Has been a, an incredible journey. Um, Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, especially, is a, a region with lots of opportunities. Just came from an exchange of best practices with, with ASEAN and, 
And would you see that uh, cybersecurity issues becoming even a, a more rel relevant and an international topic? Thanks, Basari. Uh, so Thomas Krupp of Zurich uh, Insurance Group, and you are in charge of IT services there. Um, I mean, you can look at it from both sides, kind of probably the security, cybersecurity of, of your services, but also kind of as, as your role, kind of uh, getting, getting your customers, uh, other insurances to, to take care of cybersecurity. But tell, tell me about your position and what, what, what you think about the topic. So first of all, good morning. Thanks for making it to the, one of the first sessions over here. Um, Zurich Insurance is a global insurance provider really doing business more or less in all countries in this world with a very complex portfolio. Um, and if you think about insurance, we don't have tangible assets. Everything is intangible. And if you think about intangible assets, it finally comes down to data and processes. Uh, and if you think about data and processes, that somehow translates into IT as well. Um, so technology is the backbone for everything what we're doing on a, on a global base. And um, we hope, or we, well, that's at least part of my challenge and my opportunity as well, we try to leverage technology in a way um, that it can really enable our digital transformation, that it can enable our journey to become a customer-led uh, insurance provider. And we're seeing this internally, but we're seeing that clearly also on the external side, as um, we are ensuring more or less uh, most of the enterprises in different industries and are also an advisor in the, on the risk engineering side <coughs> on how to deal with um, security and technology challenges. Thank you. Hi, Jan. So you work for Splunk. Uh, you're in charge of uh, cybersecurity and uh, I think equities or markets. Um, so Splunk is a software company and I've written about it, but I'm not sure uh, the audience knows a lot about Splunk. So tell me what, what Splunk does actually. So Splunk actually came from the word um, Splunking, which means deep cave exploration. Uh, so it really signifies the challenges that we now facing with the data explosion and ma majority of the data that's generated, 90% uh, and more, is from machine readable data, not necessarily human readable. So our mission is really about taking all this machine generated data and try to make it useful, make it meaningful, and accessible for people. So the world that I live in, I run the security business for Splunk, and data is such an important part of cybersecurity. If you bring all the data together, you connect the dots, what you're able to do is to gain a lot more insights on what's happening during foren forensics or just monitoring the behavior. Uh, we lately, in the last couple of years, took it to another level to say, well, not only for visibility, how can you turn all those insights into actions and really deliver the business outcome? That means to be able to respond at machine speed because things are happening really fast. Uh, so we really live in a world that we have to leverage technology, leverage data to try to get ahead in the challenges of cybersecurity. That's what we do. Thanks, Ayan. And Catherine, last but not least, uh, you're at uh, Columbia University at the School of uh, International and Public Affairs. You research over there. And uh, so, so tell me a little bit what you, what you focus on. I mean, we had a chat yesterday, and it's, it's cybersecurity and financial stability, I think. Yeah. Correct. Correct. Good morning. Thanks so much for having me. Um, I'm Catherine Rosen. And I, I come to this conversation with over 25 years in financial services um, in the private sector, serving in the public sector, and now in academia. And Lugwood mentioned um, our project at Columbia for the past two years. I've been working on a project focused on assessing the linkages between cyber risk and financial stability, really looking at the question of how. How does a cyber event create financial instability? In um, colloquial terms, how does a cyber event take down the financial system? And we have been really talking about these linkages because we've had such a body of work, especially in the, in the US and many countries across the world, looking at financial instability or financial stability since the financial crisis of 10 years ago. We've also been doing a lot of work in increasing defense given cybersecurity in the, in the landscape in the cyber realm. But these two areas have been on parallel paths. So we're really looking at where the overlap is and where the causal relationship could be. So looking at the aggregations of risk in the cyber world, thinking about this canon of financial stability that's been established post-financial crisis, and really what could transmit between those two? Things of the nature of loss of data integrity, loss of confidence, lack of financial substitutability, 
key common uh, mode failures within both technology and financial market infrastructures. So that's a flavor of what I've been working on. Cool, thanks Catherine. So before we start, so we're gonna talk among us here for 30 minutes and then I'm going to open it up to the audience. And to my panel, please keep it short. We only have an hour or 30 minutes uh, uh, in the first round. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, be brief. Catherine, uh, so, so one, from one first round, let, let's talk about the status quo, kind of. W what's, what's the state of cybersecurity? I mean, I said, God, it's, I said it's never gonna go away, but actually companies uh, are increasingly waking up to, to, to the risk. Um, am I right, kind of, how do, you, how do you see the landscape? Yeah, I think in a word, it's imbalanced. Uh, I think the attackers have the advantage. Defenders are doing a bunch of work, spending a ton of money, um, but yet the surface area keeps expanding. So the reliance on technology, on devices, on the internet, uh, uh, the internet of things, there's just in this vast open surface area where attackers can just need to find one little crack to come in. And the defenders have been working on innovation. There's been innovations in technology over the last decades, but we also have to remember there's been important innovations, what I would call operational areas, as well as policy areas. So I'll give you a flavor for a few of these. So in the technology space, uh, innovations such as DDoS protection, so distributed um, denial of service attacks, where um, lines are flooded, uh, public internet sites are flooded with information such that they cease to operate or at least have um, latency in operating. Um, tokenization, uh, automation of threat intelligence we've been able to do from technology perspective. But operationally, we've seen, and Ludwig mentioned this, increased attention, whether that's at board letter, uh, levels or senior management or government and official policy areas. Um, we've had improved information sharing. We have bug bounty programs. We're doing exercises at the enterprise level. Um, and we've also seen policy innovations, such as the Budapest Convention or even the regulatory world is awakening. I see that especially in financial services. Um, but, you know, we speak about attackers being sentient um, opponents. They're increasing sophistication. They're increasing resources. And they really have access to cheaper tools. So they can continue to do damage because they have that capability and the opportunity and motivation. So this real imbalance on defenders have to continue to do this work. And yes, we'll be talking about this in 10 years. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you talk about the importance of data and kind of you work with customers. What, 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 what do you see? I mean, are they aware enough what, 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 what the danger, what the risks are? You know, we are so privileged to work with many, many organizations, public sector or private sector globally. Uh, one thing I think that's consistent is the data is so valuable that if you can make good use of that, you actually have a leg up over the others. And if you don't, you're just being drowned by it. A um, lot of the things we see in cyber, just like Catherine was talking about, uh, it's really fast shifts and you manage to get one part of the organization uh, to give you better visibility and before you know it, the digital transformation really opened up a lot of new things. And one of the things that I would say just to add to what she already talked about is the world is really happening all in an automated uh, way and machine speed for how malwares are evolving, machine speed for how things are being carried out from one organization to another. And uh, if we as uh, sort of global uh, companies who does not understand how to leverage data and technology to be able to automatically and, and detect things and take action, we will always be at the mercy of the adversaries. But you said that, I mean, it's, it's important to have data and kind of to, to extract pattern out of the data. What, I mean, what about kind of, the, there's this concept which I increasingly hear about data as is kind of toxic. So you don't want to keep a lot of data if you don't need it, you want to get rid of it because I mean, may leak, you may get into privacy trouble. Uh, what do you think about that? I mean, is, 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 is data really an unalloyed good to have? So, so data definitely can be uh, a sword with sort of double edges. Uh, one of the things that I, uh, when I visit customers, they ask me, how do you deal with all this big data explosion? I always tell them, well, with more data. They said, oh, you must work for a data company. 
Um, so I said, it's not data, just general data. You got to look at the data that can give you the business context, give you the threat intelligence, give you a way to actually make sense out of the data so you can understand what is valuable, what is not valuable. At the end of the day, it, the, the data is exploding and is, is happening so much faster than any technology can handle. Uh, so we just all need to get better. So what data is really valuable so for you us need to, and focus on So you kind, on of need to, you kind of need to decide what, what am I going to throw away and what am I going to keep and really and think about. And use really the business contextual information to help you make okay. that decision, not randomly, you know, sort of like okay. throw it into the air and say this, this goes, this stays. Yeah. Thomas, layer of the land in cybersecurity. I mean, you have a very good kind of God's eye view as, as a big insurance company. Uh, that, that, that's one question. The other question I'd be interested in, I mean, I've been hearing or writing even about cyber, sec cyber security insurance for some time, uh, and it doesn't seem to be moving or becoming a big business, but perhaps I'm wrong. So maybe let me build upon what we have heard so far. So from a risk perspective, if you look at cyber from an insurance perspective, the three risks that are really growing is technology is embedded in everything what we're doing. There are no more industries that don't leverage uh, technologies. And even in remote kind of industries like hairdressers, we're seeing that attacks are bringing down um, hairdressers. I think the second thing is connectivity is continuing to grow. IoT, 5G, ecosystems, and there are no boundaries any longer. There are natu no natural borders, no mountains, no, no oceans that have to be um, passed. So this is continuing to grow. And I think the other thing that we're seeing is manual workarounds are disappearing. Um, there have been always safety nets. If technology was not there, there was always a plan B. That doesn't exist any longer. There's too much cost pressure. So we're seeing a lot of uh, issues or resulting into how do you increase business resilience? How do you, how are you prepared if you can't bring back technology? What is your plan B to recover your business? Once your data gets corrupted, how do you deal with that? Once you're out of business, how do you contact your customers? So that's, I think, a, a big thing. That's actually driving the demand for cyber insurance. And we have a lot of demand. I think the thing that hasn't grown as, uh, as forecasted is you don't sell or we are not selling so much cyber insurance. So what, what is the reason why we have a huge demand but are not really serving the market in a way as it maybe was expected? If you look at cyber risk, uh, from, a risk uh, from an insurance perspective, what we always need is a good baseline. And for a baseline, you need historical data. On the cyber side, there's not so much historical data, and the historical data that we have is actually not really meaningful as the things are changing very, very quickly. The second thing what you need is you need somehow to design risk pools. That's also very challenging because you can't contain the risk pool. Cyber is like a global earthquake. Nobody of us can ensure a global earthquake. We can contain some things and, and, and put an insurance around this one. So this is why we are seeing much more opportunity really um, on the prevention side. And if you think about prevention, it's about how does good look like? So on the motor side, we know don't drink and drive. How does that translate into cybersecurity? How do we um, create awareness? Um, what is the airbag, the safety net that we build into our industries in case something happens? Because we need to be, pre pre be prepared that something is really happening. So this is where we are seeing that the cyber insurance market is uh, clearly uh, still much more demand, but it is not that easy really to come with meaningful cyber insurance coverage. It's more really on the prevention side that you need to do first before you can have a, yeah. a proper coverage. So I mean, in, in the end, so, so you have trouble kind of pricing risk in that, in, in that business. So you don't have the, the data to, to really understand what would you inform well, you have in terms of damages? Or very black and white, you've got two approaches. Yeah. You, you can have a pricing that is prohibitive so that nobody's going to sign, or you can have a, a pricing that everybody enjoys having insurance coverage that finally will have so many exclusions yeah. that it doesn't work. And as long as the taxonomy is not clear, as long as we don't know wh how, wh 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 what does, or how does good really look like, if you have a bank robbery, well, next day in the press is somebody robbed your bank. If you have a cybersecurity breach, next day in the press normally is this company was not secure because we, we don't know, do we have the right protections over there? We haven't agreed as a community what, what are the things that you have to do to look good and what are the things that are finally then um, criminal elements where you have to say, well, I was a victim, but I'm not, I'm not the one who, who caused it. Okay. Thanks, Thomas. Belsario, so Latin America is not, uh, uh, I mean, we, we, we don't get a lot of news when it comes to cybersecurity. 
out of Latin America, which is probably um, doesn't reflect reality. But, but tell me, kind of, is, is there is there something different when it comes to cybersecurity in, in, in Latin America, or is this basically the same problem as uh, in other parts of the world? I believe, or we believe that the uh, the problems are, are very similar. Um, I would like to say that uh, there are lots of lots of but more than, than problems, actually, there are opportunities. Latin America, there is a, a market of more than 600 million of, of users. Over the past three years, uh, there has been a, a growth between the 8 to 15 percent of, of internet users. Uh, before the challenges, I want to say that actually there are, there are opportunities, there are big countries that actually are focusing on, on making sure that the internet penetration comes to all the end users, um, economies like uh, Peru, Mexico, Colombia, uh, among others, are making sure that internet comes to, to those. All countries um, in, in the hemisphere, in Latin America and Caribbean, are making sure that digital services go to, to, to all the citizens. Uh, but with those opportunities, actually, there are the challenges. Uh, I want to share something. Uh, when our Secretary General comes, came, came to office, uh, he proposed a motto to, to the organization, which is more rights for more people. Uh, yesterday, at the, we had a, a dinner for the Center for, for Cybersecurity, and I was sharing with, with our colleagues that probably the main challenge that I believe, uh, uh, that I believe for, for the region and, and probably for, for the whole world, uh, is that as we secure the, the rights for, for the people, in the physical world, we need to make sure that we secure or we protect those rights in the digital world, that there is no difference uh, between the physical and the digital world. And in order to guarantee that, to, to make sure that we have the protection of those rights, we need to change the mindset. That's the main challenge. Uh, we need to change the mindset from the leaders, from the heads of the state, to the end user. If we are able to accomplish that, probably we solve most of the equation. Of course, there are going to be many other things to overcome, but just if we start changing the mindset on how we approach, on how we perceive cybersecurity, we're going to have a huge development uh, in all sense. Thank you. Um, now, that was a very good segue to the kind of the second kind of set of questions. Uh, uh, Thomas, uh, uh, I mean, you, you, you kind of suggested that already. Kind of, but what, what, what do you think companies, governments should do? I mean, do, is, is, is it just a question of awareness, or is, is it? And, and it's a, it could be a, as easy and as a complex, but again, it was part of the discussion. And it's education. Uh, it's education and as, as simple on how to use certain tools, education as how to communicate, uh, and how to communicate to the press, how to communicate to the families, how to communicate to the people. Uh, at the end, behind institutions, behind companies, there is the people. That's the main goal when you have a company, to serve your customers. Uh, databases are customers, are composed of, of people. I'm sure at your, at your company, uh, at Surich, or at Splunk, when you were talking about data, Actually, I remember a, a great uh, article from The Economist that data is the new oil. Uh, but those data, actually, the owners are the people. So if we, are, if we are able to educate and to make sure that we can protect that data and that we can start securing uh, that information with basic tools, just making sure that you don't click in the wrong uh, link, that you at least have a good antivirus, that you have the, your proper uh, privacy tools, the, 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 that would be enough to okay. start. Thomas, same, same question to you, kind of what, what needs to be done to kind of bring cybersecurity to the next, next level? Is it, is it more a question of, uh, let's say, government action? Is it the companies that have to change? 
What, what, what do you kind of, well, what, what are the three you, points you, if, you if, if I look through our insurance lens and if I look through the different businesses, so if you look at the enterprises, I think enterprise companies have started to do the right things. They all have their programs in place, they have the structure in place, but they're clearly struggling with the legacy that is still sitting over there. You have got IT systems from the last 30, 50 years and you have to deal with the old stuff and you have to deal with the very new propositions, which finally means you have to take uh, decisions regarding where, where do you put your investments into it. Um, but enterprise business is only 20% of the business. If you think about the small medium enterprises, that's 80% of the business, they actually haven't started. They are paralyzed. It's so much what they could do, but they don't know what is the, what is the first step. Uh, so this is from a business perspective, and I think to be successful on the cyber side, it's truly a team sport. So you need the right framework from a governance perspective, um, you, you need collaboration between different industries. Um, you need collaboration, well, actually between the good guys. It's not always easy to define who's a good guy and who's a bad guy. It's much easier if you would be on the other side. These networks, these ecosystems mm. are much faster and, and, and stronger. But it's really the collaboration, the transparency, and it's finally always a kind of risk-based approach. So you have to set your priority as a company, as an individual, um, but we in convenience and security, what are the first uh, steps that you're going to take and how do you create something like your own fitness program um, to, 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 well, to be ready for whatever the new emerging risk will look like. Mm. Do, do companies actually spend enough on, 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 on cybersecurity? What, uh, I mean, or, or how much is enough actually? Well, that's an excellent question and uh, I have to say I, I have enjoyed the discussion with my board of directors when I always ask for more money on security. And uh, actually we came to the conclusion, you can spend a lot of money on technology, but uh, if you look from an outcome perspective, 30% is technology, 70% is people and processes. So we have invested a lot in companies like Splunk and so on, buying technology, um, but we are now much having much more focus really on the end user, on the awareness, on people and processes, training them regularly, um, giving them more access or more understanding why security really matters for all of us and not just for one person. So I think it's not a question of money. You have to do an investment to be to have a kind of foundation. But once you have done the investment, well, it is a continuous investment because it, it's just changing. But I think there's much more impact if you really focus on, on people and yeah. processes. And this is something that doesn't cost a lot of money, but it requires priority. And it uh, requires also leading by example from a board perspective, ex group perspective. Uh, otherwise, you, you will not really create the right kind of awareness across the company. I mean, you, you, you said that you, you buy a lot of technology. Now, uh, as a journalist, I'm always at the receiving end for, of a lot of pitches. Kind of every day, I get uh, like a couple of, of pitches from some cybersecurity firms of a new business and how. Uh, and, and I tend to kind of not write about indi individual firms because they all kind of everybody has skim in the game, of course, in, in that business. Kind of they, they all. Uh, w w this problem to, to, to appear bigger than it probably is. I mean, that, that, that's their business. But I mean, how do you make these choices? I mean, how do you kind of decide, I'm, I'm going to use Splunk versus X? Uh, it's not easy. Well, you have to have some capabilities on your side that you first of all understand your, your outgoing position or your, your, st your, your, st uh, your status that you have at this point in time from a technology perspective. And again, there's a lot of stuff. Let's take the challenge on the legacy side. You can decide that you make your legacy environment more secure, which means you're putting a lot of additional money into tech companies. And I've got many, many of them approach me with the greatest ideas what you can do on top, on, on top of what you have done already before. Or you can also decide that you might also decommission legacy and just reduce your, your footprint that you have and the, 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 the tech vectors that are, that are over there. So for, for us, we, where we have this kind of, and I think there's a good consensus at the market, the kind of basic tools and technology that you really need. And every year it is developing and uh, evolving. But my personal perspective over the last two or three years, the market has consolidated. So I'm not too excited about new technology any longer. We're clearly watching it. And it's really more about how do I move from a legacy world into a, a new world? How do I manage the new risks whilst I can't ignore the legacy that I have uh, still over there, and how do I balance that? And that's what we do, for example, with the board. Every year, at least once a year, we decide with the board the risk appetite that we have and the priorities that we have. And we have also stopped to do 100 things in parallel. 
and then we ended up in doing nothing properly. We decide for five or six priorities, then we focus on these five and six priorities, and we clearly have a very regular review process because the world is changing quite dramatically, but we're trying to set really prioritize, uh, priorities and uh, work against them. Mm. Hayan, tell me, w what are the three things companies do wrong when it comes to cybersecurity? What, what are the kind of the main faults, errors people make? I think Thomas already mentioned one of them. When you try to do too many things, and like what you mentioned, you can get inundated with new technologies, new solutions, and you think by just taking all of those that just gonna make you super secure. I think that's probably number one. Uh, number two, uh, for me, when you think about what's changing around us, the digitization of the enterprise, of the business, and the cloud transformation, sometimes we try to really focus on how do I protect things by preventing things from happening versus really acknowledge the reality. The reality is nobody gonna be able to build something that's airtight. So you want to really think about not only protecting and preventing, but really more about detecting and remediating. So I think that's the second. And the third one is really not realizing, um, everybody was talking about the people part and at the end of the day, that's the weakest link, unfortunately. And if we're not thinking and, and changing sort of how we educate, I think yesterday at the C4, uh, C dinner, uh, which is the cyber, uh, Center for Cybersecurity, a lot of the conversations is around, if we don't think about changing the culture, the culture gonna eat our strategy, and the strategy could be security strategy, could be data strategy, could be cloud strategy, and all of those are related. Um, there's many more where I can go out, but those are the three okay. that comes to mind. Thank you. Catherine, I'm, you want I'm gonna add one, yeah. actually, to your list of three. Uh, I think it's inevitable, or we have to be behaving as if we're going to be hacked, right, at the enterprise level. So where companies and the enterprise really need to be doing work is also, and Thomas alluded to this, is resiliency and this whole notion of operational resilience. And that really includes a response plan, a playbook, um, understanding how your communications work, who's going to do what to whom in this instance, and then how you're going to recover. And really having forethought. Now in the moment, in the time, there may be um, in baseball, a curveball that you may have come at you and you have to change, but at least that you've exercised this, you've worked through this, you've built this playbook and you know how to think through it. Uh, and that's, uh, and cyber risk comes in as a, as a part of this as well as an overall mitigant of risk and a part of that plan. Um, so I would add that to the list of mm. what companies should be doing and may not be doing right. And governments? And governments. We've alluded to, I think, a number of the areas where governments have been effective um, and I think where governments have more opportunity. Um, I think governments are doing well or doing better in terms of cooperating with each other. I think that we're seeing, especially at least in the United States, which I have the best view to, is um, providing information, information sharing with enterprise. Um, and that can always be more useful. I think enterprise would like to get information that not just this you know, onslaught of information, but information that's actually relevant and useful, um, and that they can put to work in their own intel um, shops and their own cybersecurity shops. Um, we could do a lot better having a global governance structure. Uh, so, you know, I think about financial stability issues, and when we ran into the financial crisis 10 years ago, the G20 quickly convened. But why not have an ICT20? What do we do when technology breaks and it breaks globally? Where do we convene? What is the body we bring together to be able to work through these issues? Um, right now, we turn to the Financial Stability Board to talk through these issues and financial services, but it may not be a financial services problem. It may be somewhere else. Uh, so I think governments can do a lot more for overall cooperation, whether it's in norms and having more countries sign up to the Budapest Convention and otherwise. The other side of that is where does government maybe do too much? Uh, we're seeing in the regulatory space, enterprise would argue that there's too much regulation. I would argue that regulation in and of itself is not bad, it just needs to be right. So in the sense that in cyber world, you really wanna think about principles-based regulation or risk-based regula regulation, nothing that's too prescriptive. Um, that can't be agile and move. We've been talking about through this dinner we referred to in our conversations um, prepping for this panel. You know, technology is outpacing 
all of us, and the adversaries are outpacing all of us, whether that's operational, whether that's tech technical, or that's even um, policy-wise. So we have to remain agile in all the ways that we approach this so that we can try to keep pace. Thanks. Belisario, I mean, what, what, what's your assessment of the state of international cooperation when it comes to cybersecurity? I mean, I've, I've, I've kind of posited it's, it's, it's going into the wrong, into no, the wrong no, direction, like but... In, from our side in the Americas, uh, international cooperation, it's, it's outstanding. Um, as I say, um, we have been able to adopt, since 1999, uh, the Minister of Justice and Prosecutors have been adopting, have been meeting every two years and adopt recommendations. For example, uh, Minister of Justice have endorsed uh, the Budapest Convention. We have in, uh, in, in the Western Hemisphere, we have in decided to, to adopt a new convention, although we have conventions on human rights, on terrorism, on, on, on different things. Um, two years ago, there was a decision to establish a new group on, on confidence building measures. We are actually, in a month, we're gonna house a regional consultation meeting for, for the GG. And with the general support of governments such as Canada, the UK, the USA, Spain, Estonia, and actually private sector actors, which are key for, for, for this ecosystem, like uh, AWS, Microsoft, Trend Micro, we have been able to, to support, uh, based on the mandate that we receive, we have been able to to assist uh, the development of 12 national strategies, 22 national certs, lots of reports, research, and outreach. And this is all based on trust. So it's more than international cooperation because international cooperation, if there is no trust, there is nothing. So again, we were just actually changing best practices with, with ASEAN. And, and the key element is trust. When we go to a country, Actually, we go uh, with a group of experts exchanging best practices from government, private sector, and civil society. Uh, and actually, the message there is let's build trust between the uh, multiple stakeholders, between the private sector, the civil society, uh, academia, and develop a national plan or develop an awareness raising campaign or develop something. Um, so it's, it's very unique what we have in, in, in the Americas. And we, of course, cooperate with, with, with other regions. Uh, I think there is a lot of room to, to, to improve, as always. But there are good expectatives around the world. Mm. Th Thomas, what, what is kind of your wish list? What would you, would you, would you want governments to do? Well, uh, 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 and I'm sorry. Uh, oh. No, Thomas. Well, he he yeah. seems to have a long wish list as well. So, um, <laughs> I, I think, um, as I said, it, it is a global challenge that we have. It doesn't stop at any kind of boundaries. So I think this is my biggest ask because we're seeing a lot of kind of collaborations starting to happen, but they are in regional and local things. So I think that is the one thing, really keep it in mind that it's global. And I think the second one, which is the biggest challenge that we're seeing as well, and this uh, is around transparency. If you get attacked, it's very difficult to say I got attacked because everybody then, the perception is, oh, this is a bad company. So I think if government can help us to, as I said, describe how good actually looks like so that we can report back and say there was somebody attacking us. I, I think that would take away a lot of these kind of restrictions to share the patterns that we have. And once we share the patterns that we have, you have a much better chance to be protected. So really helping us to set the taxo taxonomy on a global base mm. I think that would be my ask to the government. Yeah. So before I open it to the, um, the audience, uh, question from the audience, Hayan, same question to you, kind of what, what's your wish list to governments? So yesterday at the dinner, one of the things we all recognized, acknowledged, uh, we're in this asymmetric warfare. Uh, what we're trying to do is the adversaries are free to collaborate. They actually are encouraged and benefit from the collaboration collaboration. While the rest of the world of where we're trying to defend, we are, our hands are tied and, and uh, behind our backs. And because of all this, if you share, there's benefits, but there could be a lot of downside risk. Uh, we were joking as much as, you know, the other side don't have lawyers, we have a lot of them. Uh, so, so for me, the really request is 
I think humans, uh, we are a very small community uh, in cyber and we actually have the trust and we share. But when we try to turn that into a technology centric and driven sharing, and we love to have government across the globe to give us that freedom when that sharing happens, if something does go wrong, there is some protection. I think the other thing is when we share, we expect actions. Right now, if sharing is only one direction and the motivation to continue to share is not gonna be there. Okay, thank you. So yes, now up to you, questions from the audience. Please, please state your name and affiliation and uh, keep it short. And of course, it's hard for me to see anybody here, but uh, any questions here? Over there. Sorry, sorry, you're next. Okay, thank you, panel. Very wonderful discussion. My name is Yan Qinghong from Peking Univers University. I, I, uh, I work with government working on uh, rule making, regulation, or standard making. So, and the, when the panelists talk about the right level of pres prescriptiveness for law and standard, so I'm wondering what's your opinion on that since government will issue regulation anyway. So, what's the right level of prescripti uh, prescriptiveness of law and standard? for companies better, because we see different area, region, country issue different level of that kind of a law. So that's my question. So Catherine, I think so. I was, as a user, do you want to answer? I, I, could, I could start. Yeah, um, so is. yes, I think it's a, it's a very good point because we, we, we are not asking for too much regulation because that's one of the challenges that we have as well. So many controls that it's, you need a huge machinery to keep up with regulation. And we have experimented in different or with different countries sandbox approaches as well. This is not only true on the cybersecurity side, but for all technologies. You have to have these kind of environments where you can test things and then um, work on the regulation side as well. And this is where it's my uh, ask or my wish as a, as a user really to have that uh, opportunity with our regulator to work together to think about how the environments need to look like to experiment and then take decisions and not to have too many details, uh, descriptions and subscriptions that making my life really difficult, where I spend a lot of money just to keep standards and ticking the box, but not really looking at what, what is the thing that I have to do to make the environment more secure. What, sorry, but what, what we're seeing in, in, in the Latin America and the Caribbean region, uh, this is, there is gonna be a, a never ending regulation and as the technology continue evolving. Um, and I believe uh, governments and actually the industry is, is getting aware of this. Actually, uh, we have been discussing the possibility of actually raising more awareness of this. Uh, there are certain industries, like for example, the, the financial sector who are starting to, to regulate, um, actually at, at their own initiative. Uh, what we are seeing uh, in a region, uh, they are following the NICE standards, uh, which actually many countries have uh, adopted the, the NICE standards and, and are creating their own standards. Uh, in the case of, for example, uh, in Americas, Uruguay have adopted the NICE standard for themselves, the same Canada, and I'm, I believe other, other countries like Israel, the United Kingdom, have used NICE for, for their own purpose. Uh, yeah, what we see in, in, in America is the, that framework is a, is, is a good start, it's a good model, uh, and, and can help different industries at least to, to provide like a, a baseline for, for security as a, as a whole. Catherine, I mean, you, you mentioned kind of, I mean, what we have to move towards is kind of risk-based regulation or kind of, or principles-based regulation. I mean, what's the general trend uh, 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 across the world? I mean, or is there, is there one? I think there's acknowledgement that that yeah. is the appropriate way to go. I think it's difficult. I think it's difficult to figure out where to put pen to paper in the regulatory world. We had a new regulation put out for comment in the United States um, from our banking regulators, and it was vehemently opposed by industry, and it died. So we haven't even made that next step to try to get to, uh, I would call it 2.0 generation of, of cybersecurity regulation, though we know that there's a number of regulatory um, prescriptions around IT 
the mention of the NIST framework, I think, is important because what it is is it's a collection of existing standards and approaches on how to think about cyber hygiene, but not just cyber, cyber hygiene, but almost operational resiliency as the whole. And the point of it and where it was developed, and it took a few years to develop this framework, is that it's as applicable to a small and medium-sized enterprise as it is to the largest. Now, the largest banks in the world have a maturity far past what NIST even prescribes, but it is a body of work that can be applicable across sectors, across sizes of enterprises. So it's gotten a lot of take up in different regions of the world for being a really great first start to think about a cyber hygiene. Thank you. Another question in the first row. Thank you. So, sorry, I was confused. The other one was over my head. No problem. <laughs> my name is Joanna Bryson. I'm from the University of Bath uh, in the UK, presently in the EU. And uh, I also was asking a question about uh, this, this, this claim about uh, a principles level regulation. So in AI, we've been working on regulation for a few years now. I think we're making some really good progress, actually. I've been very impressed by the convergence as uh, academia has helped educate government, and government has made some really good and strong, you know, the top people are great, actually. So we have the principles out, but it, I don't think that's enough. That's the first step, and everybody's saying now, how do we enforce the principles? At least in AI, uh, a lot of it has been about saying, look, it's only like any other manufacturing, we just need to enforce accountability and we need to actually hire regulatory bodies so we can go and check the books to make sure that people are doing due diligence when they, when they create AI. So it hasn't been about creating a lot of new law, it's been more about hiring the right kind of people that can go and check that people are just following good practice. So I guess I, I would like to push a little harder about the next stage after you agree principles, not that that's done yet. Who wants to take that? Thomas? Well, I, I think you, you, you're right, because uh, a framework is a framework, and if nobody's doing anything, it really doesn't, uh, doesn't help. And I think specifically on the cyber side, you have to be fast. You can't just wait, close your eyes, and hope that something, some, somebody else is going to help you. And I think from a regulation perspective, this kind of copy-paste, if somebody has evaluated something that makes somehow sense, bringing this into a global context and then thinking about what is now the next step that you have to do to, to really make it stick and to make it happen. I think that that's where we have to get as a community much better than we are at this point in time because we have to be much faster. We spoke about where well, the other guys, they don't need to go through ex -cos, they don't need to ask their lawyers, they just they just exploit technology as good as we exploit technology as well, the cheap access to computing, um, AI, you can, you can do with technology whatever you want to. So I think having a framework very quickly, but then also adapting it very quickly and having this kind of check and balance. And this is from an insurance perspective where we can help as well. If somebody is adapting faster, the risk premium goes down. So your insurance premium is finally smaller than the one if you're just waiting and uh, hoping that nothing happens. I'd also add that, um, it, and I learned a lot from your question, actually, but the point being is that if we get too prescriptive, we'll end up with unintended consequences. And that we've seen that all through financial regulation over the last 20 years. Um, and you can see that again in terms of what, are, what is the objective, what is the, what is the mission, what are you actually trying to solve for when you think about regulation in toto. And so you want to be thoughtful about if you turn dials one way or the other, where are the outcomes? and the consequences from that adoption. I, I agree with you. Uh, it's not that, like, there needs to be a deep study on that. And actually, there are different markets, different economies. We always say that each country has its own uh, cultural, economic, and, and, and social uh, particularities, uh, especially uh, in, in the Americas region. Um, we actually, um, in our case, for example, we follow uh, with the Inter-American Development Bank, we actually follow uh, the Oxford model, uh, cybersecurity maturity model that we're about to, to release. And it's very important, besides the re regulation, actually know the state of the art of cybersecurity of each country, the prevention side, how actually prepared are the countries uh, on education, on awareness, on workforce, because it doesn't matter if you have a extreme good regulation, extreme good legislation, but if you don't have the proper capacities to enforce that regulation, 
like you will not do nothing. So it's better actually to, from our side, we, we actually like to focus on, on what can we do to protect and prevent certain things. Uh, of course, without, I'm not saying that it's not important regulation, but it's actually important to, to see other things as well, especially in development economies. Uh, let's keep in mind that actually the world, it's, it's really big. We have actually many internet users out there and, 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 and we need to, to protect them. So if I can just add, um, maybe I'll just offer a different view when I think about AI and cybersecurity. Uh, the good news is we're still so early in that sort of process of learning how AI can be applicable. And if you think about you know, the term AI and, and data, how the data is sort of the field for AI, uh, in cyber, a lot of the knowledge that the humans have on how to respond to, how to, respond to incidents is still in our head. It's not codified, it's not digitized, and the latest sort of trend in the cybersecurity space is how do you use automation technology, orchestration technology to really start record and digitize our ability to, to do that. So I always say when companies go there to say we have AI for everything, for security, it's like, well, based on what? So I think it's too early even for us to say, hey, what regulations we're gonna put on, uh, how AI is used to do security incidents response. But on the other side, it's good news because it's early. If there's things that we've learned through other applications of AI in other fields, we can start providing the right guidance, then we're in a really better space. And especially in the world, everything is becoming borderless. In the world that everything is sort of going to go into the cloud, the more that you have less control, the more you want to use technology and standardization to help you have a better sense on what's going on. So that's at least th from the angle that AI is a great technology, but we're still really early in applying that to do automated response. Mm. But I mean, you say what, what I found is interesting that your perception is that there's kind of progress being made, a lot of progress being made in terms of how to regulate AI. And, and I, I was wondering whether that's actually true. I mean, what, I, what I've seen, for example, out of, the, out of Brussels are very high level guidelines. Uh, yeah. Well, I was, I was talking more, oh, sorry, I was talking more to, uh, for example, what's happening in the UK, what's happening in uh, the OECD has put out some really good guidelines again, which are less, a little less high line level. But the EU actually only a couple of years ago already uh, figured out that, that we needed these regulatory bodies and then that's being spread. So it's almost under the under the radar while everybody's discussing these high level principles at the same time the infrastructure is being built. Um, but the UK has actually been leading in this space and is making some really good progress and some great hires actually within the government. Um, I wanted to say one other thing which actually comes back to your point about how do you get, uh, how do you get this? How do you get enough critical mass to have things agreed? And also to your point about having the companies push back there was massive corporate pushback on GDPR, but Europe was a big enough common market that they could actually say, we've decided this is what has to happen. And it is agile legislation. We expect it to shake out as, as it's prosecuted. Um, and, and, uh, but the, the, the corporates that originally resisted it now have realized that it makes it much easier to do business because there is a common set of regulations across a very large market space. So that's something that was previously seen as a problem with Europe compared to uh, you know, China yeah. and America. But Ka I think Catherine, do you, do you agree that yeah, GDPR yeah, is a good thing? Yeah, you, you actually bring <laughs> up, I think, one of the biggest tensions that we're experiencing, especially around cybersecurity. And, and we suffer from it in the United States because we have 10 financial regulators, and so we can't figure out how to regulate anything with commonality. Commonality, harmonization, is a is a big difference maker. Uh, you know, I, I, I worked on Capitol Hill on Dodd-Frank legislation, and it got to the point where industry said, just tell us, tell us what it's going to be and what it's going to look like and have it be common amongst us. We'll figure out how to do business around it. 
And I think that that's a really important tenet in that if, you, if, if you're, there's something that's going to be done from a regulatory perspective, let's have it harmonized. Let's work towards harmonization such that we're building resilience across all borders and not having tensions coming up against borders and national boundaries on something that's borderless. Do, do, do you expect actually the US uh, or DC to come up with a common privacy legislation for the US? Or do you think it's gonna be, uh, remain as fragmented as? I think that's difficult. Yeah, it's gonna be California. <laughs> I think that's okay, more. Can I want at sure. one point about GDPR, just from where we sit in the industry, what I really liked about it is it's we're able to quantify uh, what the punitive damages are. That makes people understand what this means. And, and also able to quantify to say we're, our expectation 72 hours, you gotta re report what's going on that have driven a lot of new thinking. What do I need to know within 72 hours in order to report and make a decision what to report? Uh, I would say those two elements besides a lot of other things has been super valuable and people are thinking about hygiene for cyber. That gets to that respond and recover. You have to have a plan together to be able to get to 72 hours. Thank you. Uh, we have time for two more questions. Any questions from the audience? All the way back there. Thank you. Uh, I'm Timothy Ma from Hong Kong. I want to ask, uh, actually, we have a lot of regulations and compliance requirement for all cops. But for the cybersecurity, actually, what we aim at is not the big cop or the well-established cops, but are those who hackers and also who have, well, some purposeful hacking, something like that. But how to balance? Because, you know, whenever we have new rules and regulations, the big cops are always say that we already in a good shape. But why still being demanded to follow the new rules? But how about the small company? How about the hackers? How about those who are, have, well, other purpose to do that? So any advice? for the government when they set the rules and regulations, who should be their target audience? Uh, I, I'd be happy to take that sure. to start with. Um, I think we covered, there's regulations, there's guidance, there's punitive sort of damages that uh, people are trying to assess. Um, I don't think they're particularly targeted to say, is it hackers, is it enterprise? is really getting the hygiene, getting the culture started to have, have a baseline. Um, and your point is, well, there's all this technology be deployed, all these regulations, how come there's still things happen? Uh, I always use analogy. It's, it, the analogy is like, you know, the human um, health and medical system and insurance system. Uh, over the years, we all evolve, but the germs and the viruses evolves as well. And the only way for us to get stronger is to have a better hygiene, to exercise, and to continue to develop better medicine, uh, to continue to work together and share information so epidemic doesn't become a global. Uh, I think there's a lot of analogy there. And uh, in cyber, I don't think you should ever expect that things just won't happen. It will continue to evolve. It's a rising tides. Um, so that's, that, that's what I would li like to say. Sure. Yeah, perhaps I can add, at least in the, in the Americas, um, when our member states, right now we are working, just this year we're working with, uh, with Belize, with, um, with Guyana, with the third strategy of Colombia. Uh, with these countries, as I mentioned, we work with the civil society, that includes hackers, that includes NGOs, with the private sector, that includes, um, all different companies, and, and there is a process. Uh, and, and with that process, we make sure that civil liberties are, are guaranteed. So with national policies and, and legislations, um, actually we try to, to make sure that those documents actually are reviewed by our Inter-American Commission on Human Rights. There is a repertoire of freedom of speech. Uh, we have actually a, an Inter-American Commission of Women uh, because it's not just, um, for us, it's not just freedom of speech, but actually it's a gender component that sometimes is not taken into account, and for us it's really important. Um, so it's, it's not just on, on legislation and regulation. There are certain policies as well that have a huge impact 
on, on, other, on other aspects. So from our side in, in Latin America and the Caribbean, that's part of our day to day. Um, I'm positive and I, I'm sure that governments are trying to do their best to make efforts to be as inclusive uh, as possible and to respect the rights of, of citizens. Uh, of course, it's a very difficult uh, space and when something arrives, we always encourage every person to go through the Inter-American system and there is, a, there is a procedure which is the Inter-American Commission on, on Human Rights. I have to interrupt you, we're out of time. Um, actually, I'm supposed to sum this up. I'm gonna dispense with that. It was a very interesting discussion and my guess is we're gonna talk about the same things 10 years from now. Thank you very much, thanks to the audience. Thanks to the panel.